Welcome to the Encrypted Classic Horror Podcast, and to a first for the show, as well as something of a departure, for instead of a story, we have an interview. I'm very honoured to welcome onto the show Richard Lamb, son of the hugely influential ghost story and horror anthologist Hugh Lamb. He'll be talking about his late father, and how he has recently taken up the mantle from Hugh, overseeing the release of an unfinished and unpublished anthology, and working on a new collection to be published in the near future. But first, for those not in the know, a little bit of background. For lovers of classic horror fiction like me, there are probably a couple of golden ages. The 1920s and 1930s saw the publication of the first ghost book, curated by Lady Cynthia Asquith, as well as the rather more gruesome selections of Christine Campbell Thompson and Charles Birkin in the respective Not at Night and Creeps series. 1959 saw the first of the Pan Book of Horror anthologies compiled by Herbert Bontal, quickly joined by the Robert Aikman-edited Fontana Great Ghost Stories and Mary Danby's Great Horror Stories and a host of imitators from other publishing houses. I was too young for these golden ages, although the pan books were in my home growing up. But the 70s and 80s were another golden age. They certainly seemed to be for me, dominated by a handful of names that became a guarantee of quality and every bit as revered as the authors whose stories they were collecting, Names like Richard Dolby, Peter Haining, Mike Ashley, and of course, Hugh Lamb. Hugh's first collection, The Tide of Terror, was published in 1971, and set the template for a Hugh Lamb anthology that would be successfully applied to another 20 volumes issued in his lifetime. A mixture of known and less well-known authors, whose work had not been reprinted in decades, and in many instances had been freshly disinterred by Lamb for new audiences. Hugh Lamb cemented in my mind the notion of the anthologist as archaeologist. Like the antiquarian protagonists of M.R. James, Lamb was an antiquary himself, a scholar in supernatural fiction. His excellent anthologies were the product of careful research and extensive reading. Sadly, Hugh Lamb died in 2019, but, but fittingly perhaps he has published a posthumous collection, and Midnight Never Come which his son Richard was able to complete, drawing on his father's notes and archives. And I'm delighted to have Richard join us from his home in America to tell us all about it. Richard, um, firstly, how are you? And uh, how on earth did you end up over there? I am very well, thank you. Um, The story is pretty simple. I married a New Yorker. My wife is also a writer. She's a published author. And about 13 years ago, we, we met on an online writers forum. I just started writing and I wanted to meet other writers. So I joined this writers forum and she was also a member. And we just hit it off straight away. And we, we became very good friends. The, that became more of a romance. But it became a, quite a long distance romance for many years. Eventually, 2016, we got married in New York. We lived there for three years and then COVID came and it kind of made us rethink city life. It was harsh. I mean, New York at the time was the epicenter of of COVID when it started. So we we just decided we we wanted to get out of New York. We wanted to move around a bit. So the last year we spent just moving about. Um, At the moment, we're looking after a friend's beach house in Florida which uh, it's awful, but we're muddling through. Um, <laughs> we're, we're, we're being brave. And we're both working on our next books. So uh, she's working on her next thriller. I'm working on my next anthology. And uh, we're here till June. Well, it looks lovely. I, got, I can see the sunlight shining through the window there. Yeah, it actually makes me look better, right? <laughs> Fades the lines. So, but, um, yeah, that's, that's how I got here. And you're a web designer? I'm a web designer, first and foremost, yeah, and a cover mm-hmm. artist, so graphic designer. Uh, I do web websites, I do book jackets. Uh, and uh, so originally, uh, you were from... Uh, Sutton. Sutton. Uh, Sutton, yes, in South London. Uh, he was born in Sutton. He never, ever moved out of Sutton. I was born in Sutton. I couldn't wait to move out of Sutton. <laughs> uh, same as my brother. Um, but yeah, we, we are from, from the southernmost point of London. And do you miss the UK? There's certain things I miss about the UK. There's stupid things like Cornish pasties and sausage rolls. <laughs> Obviously, I miss my family. I miss my son. I miss my brother. Um, 
I haven't really gotten to see anyone in a couple of years because because of COVID. And uh, yeah, sometimes I'm, I do miss it because it's home. You know, where, how, wherever you go, uh, where you grew up is home, and there's things that are unique to it that you just don't find anywhere else. Uh, tell us a little bit about that childhood then in in Sutton. Um, what was <laughs> Hugh like as a father, and how much understanding did you have of your father's work uh, when you were growing up? Okay, so he was a he was a good father. He was uh, he was a good man. I think that's what counts. He was he was decent, liberal minded, fair minded. He instilled these qualities in us, but he was also, uh, anyone who knew him would tell you he was extremely funny, very witty. Mm. Um, he used to make us laugh a lot. Um, so we grew up in a, in a household that was quite bright at times. Very, you know, we laughed a lot. Uh, he could be stern like any other father, um, but he was, he was a good friend as well. As, as we got older, he became a good friend. Certainly towards the end of his life, we would talk often. And I, he was he was what a parent should be at that at that time a good friend. When he was when I was younger, I I, I knew that he published books. Uh, when I was very young, I didn't really get it what they were what was going on. I just knew they were scary, and that was you know that was good enough for me. I thought it was very cool to have my name in the dedication. So when he brought back a, a book and said, "Oh look, that's you," mm. I mean I thought that was the coolest thing in the world as a, as a kid didn't really get the stories. I tried reading them when I was younger, but they were a little advanced. And then growing up, I, 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 every now and then I return to them, but I, I'll tell you that my appreciation for the stories really hit home when I was asked to do the Ash Tree press covers. Mm-hmm. Uh, because I'd been to art college, I was an artist, and, uh, and my dad told um, the publisher about that. And they asked me to, if I'd be interested in doing the covers for, you know, uh, there was a Right. Visible Eye, Out of the Dark, In the Dark, uh, Ghost in the House. So in order to do that, I would read the stories to get some inspiration. What was I going to do for the cover? And that really is what reignited my interest in the stories. Okay. So that was mid-90s. Um, so I was in my mid-20s, and, and, and that's when I came back to it. Okay, so so you came to do those illustrations for the Ashtree Press. Mm-hmm. And before then, you'd grown up with a kind of idea of your father's background as an anthologist yeah i mean uh, even before that time um i think uh, it was the late 80s was the first time i went Mm. to a fantasy con with him i think it was 89 and uh he asked me if i wanted to come with him because he was uh, one of the guests of honor and uh, we went and um, i can't remember where it was i might have been in brighton but um i remember watching my father in a room with this queue of people wanting mm. his autograph. And that was like, that was, that was an eye opener because, uh, you know, you know, your dad publishing, he's publishing books and you know that people must be reading them or they wouldn't get published. And you know that there are a genre at which you are now interested in, but to see a group of people queuing up to get your father's autograph, you know, that's, that's an eye opener. That's bizarre. Um, and he loved it. I mean, he was <laughs> in his element. Who wouldn't be? Mm. Uh, why why do you think his name his brand caught on and 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 why did people think that they knew Hugh from his anthologies that's a good question um I mean I can't speak for every anthologist I know that my father's introductions to each story were very well Mm. done and he always seemed to inject his particular his personality into them he was you know he loved them and he had the passion for them and he was he was engaging and that came across in his introductions and clearly he knew what he was talking about um i think perhaps the the story selections themselves were what um brought people in because he 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 really did care about what he was choosing what he was putting out there he didn't want to just collect as whatever was available and publish it he wanted Mm. to you know, he wanted to get stories to people that he thought they would enjoy. And maybe people picked up on that. That's really just guesswork. He, you know, people who knew him, he, he got a reputation as just a good guy. And maybe that passed along, um, certainly with the advent of the internet, I'm sure that that was discussed. Some 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 people have just kind of got a, got a magnetism to them, I think, haven't they? Um... Yes, that's very true. I'm, I'm not one of them. But my <laughs> father, I think, certainly. But... He had a, a love for, for horror, uh, and that came across, obviously, um, in those books. Um, did 
he passed that love of horror on to you? Um, did you get it from a young age? Or? <laughs> yes, completely. Um, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, really. I, from from the time I could read, I wanted to read about ghosts and UFOs and monsters, Bigfoot, Loch Ness Monster. I mean, all of it. I was absolutely enthralled by the supernatural, by horror, horror movies, tr- you know, true true stories always got me going. I used to buy these, you know, the, the, the magazine, The Unexplained, that was like this uh, monthly publication that had all these true stories about people bursting into flames for no reason or, or you know, UFO visitations. And, and uh, I lapped it up, for all of it. And horror movies we watched together. So my dad loved to watch horror movies, so we would always watch them together. And that's carried on until my adulthood. I'm, I am, even now, um, a horror fanatic. Did, did I think he, it's the greatest, it's the greatest genre. Right. Did Did he show you things that maybe you were too young for? You know, some of those those films that you might have been exposed to. Yeah, I know a lot of psychologists who would probably say yes to that, <laughs> but I haven't grown up into um, a, you know a serial killer or uh, anything. Um, sinister because of that mm. um a bit neurotic maybe but i don't know if i can blame that on horror movies I think yeah i mean he he disregarded age you know certificates mm. and age restrictions always i think um, and i think course, we're about the same think, age aren't we we're we're, we're we're roughly the same age i think I, I would say so i mean i i we grew up in the in the 70s 70s 80s yes and and that, that was a kind of rich time for horror it was it was uh, i mean I, I'm, um, I'm thinking even when i was a child there were kind of comics like shiver yes. and shake that were aimed at Absolutely, children you, yes. you were you yeah. were weaned on to hammer magazine i used to buy hammer mm. magazine all the time i remember the the cartoon strip of captain chronos vampire hunter for some reason that stuck in my head but yeah uh so it caught on almost immediately and it never left and do you think your tastes were the same you, you and your fathers or, or or did they differ in some ways <clears throat> They were, they were, they differed slightly. He was a big fan of uh, Dario Argento movies and uh, Lucio Fulci. And Mm. uh, when I was a teenager or early teenager, um, when we were watching them, I wasn't so, I wasn't so taken. I was, like I said, I I was going to be going to art college. I was an artiste. I was a bit of a snob. So yes, I sort of sniff at those movies, but uh, he kind of just said, no, they're really good. They're really good. And he, he kind of taught me to appreciate directors and how they worked and he actually would sit me down and we'd look at like say city of the living dead and he'd say look what he does lucio fulci makes it seem like the world is changing so i would watch it and he was right you know there were, the lighting changed there was this mysterious wind blowing and it did seem like the world was different in these movies that he made and he gave me an appreciation of, of you know low budget horror he loved zombie movies right he would watch all of those Dreadful Italian zombie movies that just <laughs> proliferated in the 80s. And you know the ones I mean. And he loved them all. He was actually asked to write the zombie entry in the Penguin Encyclopedia of Horror because he loved zombies so much. Right. What were your favourites? Um, I liked, I was a big John Carpenter fan. Right. Um, I loved The Fog and uh, Halloween, obviously. Um, when, when we like got into the early 90s, I, was, I became a big fan of the of Asian horror movies. Um, yes. You know, there's this wave mm. of movies with, you know, the women with the long black hair. I love yes. them. Um, and uh, I was never a big fan of slasher movies. Um, mm. I mean, I loved Halloween. Uh, there's a few others I like, but for the most part, slasher movies leave me cold. What we both loved was ghost stories. We both mm. loved a good ghost story, um, be it written or, or movie. So uh, we both love, I don't know if you've ever seen The Woman in Black. The 1989 yes. version. So yes. it's got to be the 1989 version because there's that we watched together and we literally screamed. You know the scene I'm talking about. Yes. Right? <laughs> so, um, yeah, we both loved that. The Haunting was a favourite of ours, the original. And um, M.R. James, we used to both, we, did, we could both talk about M.R. James' work because I was a, I enjoyed M.R. James and I enjoyed the ghost stories for Christmas. Mm. We watched them. So when he, he eventually managed to get hold of those on videotape. We'd sit and watch them, and uh, yeah, they were. They were very I think good. when when you said that that horror is the best genre, 
Yeah, I yeah. mean, it's certainly the most visceral. And I think um, those things you you see, uh, particularly when you're younger, they they do live yes. with you, don't they? They do resonate. Absolutely. I've yeah, I've never yeah. forgot the ending to Don't Look Now. I mean, I could I oh could God, see yeah. it whenever I close my eyes. You yes. know. Oh my God, it's it's horrifying. But also, I think um, what I love about horror is is the creativity, the imagination. Mm. But the, the best, some of the best horror movies I've ever seen were more than just a horror movie. They have something to say, mm. like uh, Dawn of the Dead, you know, or uh, I saw a movie recently called Relic. Uh, I don't know if yes. you've seen it. It's mm. had me in tears at the end because it was just so moving. It's still a horror movie. So I think, um, I think horror movies get overlooked too mm. often. Mm. They get, you know, they, they're subject to a lot of snobbery. But uh, I think that there's great beauty in horror if you are prepared to look for it. And I think my dad felt the same way, that horror was right. it was an expressive genre. It wasn't just about entertainment. It's an expressive genre. It can, it can give a mess, carry a message. Absolutely. Um, uh, this, this might surprise people who, who mainly might associate Hugh's name with the Victorian, yeah. the gaslit horrors. Oh, it's, yes. He loved... He loved horror, but I think the Victorian ghost story and the, the vintage horror story were the they were his um, entry point into the genre. Mm-hmm. So there was an affection for it. But yeah, he he had a very very cool taste. Okay, well, we probably got a bit ahead of ourselves because some people um, may not know that much about you. Um, okay. So um, you've recently become very close to your father's work uh, and his methods, yes. um, but the job of the anthologist might be a mystery to some listeners. How did Hugh go about the act of compiling these anthologies? Well, he, I mean, he started out as a reader, like everyone else. So mm. he, he, he just liked to read uh, ghost stories and horror stories. But um, he told me be- shortly before he died that uh, Randall's Round was the, store, mm. the book that got him into the genre. And he found that he was eventually just reading the same stories over and over because there was a, there was a seemed to be a finite number. So he decided mm. to start seeking out stories that maybe were lesser known that hadn't been published, you know, since their, their original date. So he would go to old secondhand bookshops. He would go to the library and, you know, research um, books that he could probably maybe borrow through the interlibrary loan mm. system. And he acquired such a collection of these stories that were unused that he started suggesting to other people, other anthologists, you know, here's a story you could use in your next book. Why don't you try this? Right. Uh, he reached out to Peter Haining and Peter mm. Haining said to him, well, why don't you do an anthology since, you know, you have all this material. Why don't you do your own? So that's what got dad started. And I think his driving code for, for putting these things together was that what stories do I think other people would enjoy? What stories do I want to share? It was like a passion for him to, to share these stories with, with other people. So he would pick the stories that he thought, you know, that he gave him a, a spine tingle that he thought were, were worth um, other people reading. And he would put them together in a manuscript. Um, back then, you had to have a certain page count uh, yeah. through, you know, the publisher. But he reached out to a few publishers and then W.H. Allen agreed to do his first uh, tide of terror and yes. um and that and it took off um and i think it took off even though you know there was there was richard dolby there were other anthologists that were it, it really took off because he had started to print stories that made other anthologies maybe look a little lazier because they were just putting the same stories out but uh, i mean what his his um his process really was about what stories do i want to share with everyone else Yes. You know, it's, it's, uh, it was really what drove him to, to carry on doing it. <laughs> so, so rereading, um, some of these books, um, I mean, I'm <clears throat> often struck by your father's good taste. The anthologies uh, are often mixed bags. Um, you know, you're going to get some good ones, some you don't yeah. like as much. Um, uh, but you know, quite a good hit rate, uh, for me personally in, in, in Hugh's work. <laughs> um, so what do you think Hugh looked for in a story? I think he looked, um, first and foremost, it had to be something unknown. You know, it had to be something that wasn't, right. that hadn't been printed in, in a, either in a long time or, um, since it was originally published. But he also used a, a number of new stories as well in his, his earlier anthologies. So he liked, he liked a, a no nonsense, 
simple story that gave you a, you know, a chill, like that, mm. that thrill, you know, of, of reading mm. something that made, fires your imagination and makes you start to wonder about what it might be like. And so, you know, he, he, like M.R. James, anything that could recreate that thrill of reading an M.R. James story and, and getting that little shiver and, you know, the hairs on the back of your neck going up, he, he liked that. Yeah. He thought horror should be fun, so he wanted the stories to, you know, he wanted to keep that fun, the fun of being scared in a, in a safe space. Right. Um, that was important to him because he thought that horror should be fun. Personally, I think as well that, you know, with, with what I know about him, I think he, want, he liked stories that kind of give you, give you a sense of the time in which they were written. So right. like a Victorian story that wasn't just a ghost story or a horror story, but also a story about that time. It gave you a sense of what it was like to be in that time. Mm. He loved the language of the time, the way, the, the manners, the way people are with each other. He found it quite amusing, I think, as well, the, 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 the mores of Victorian life. So, yeah, yes. I think uh, I think that mattered to him. Maybe not so much. Now, you mentioned um, earlier Peter Haining. Um, yes. Uh, because obviously um, the period when your father was most prolific was a heyday for the horror anthology, yes. I think. Um, you know, so he was in touch with these people. You, you kind yes. of seemed to suggest there was a bit of a kind of um, almost a black market in, in these <laughs> stories. Who can find the most yes. obscure story? Uh, yeah. Uh, was it a healthy competition? You know, I, um, after, he, after he died, you know, I went through his paperwork and I found a treasure trove of correspondence between right. my dad and uh, Peter Haining and Richard Dalby and Mike Ashley and, and, and a few others. And uh, I I never really picked up on any kind of, at least, um, you know, uh, obvious competition. In fact, it was almost the opposite. They were very supportive of each other, right. especially um, Richard Dalby and, and uh, my dad would always write about a book they just found. And then Richard Dalby would say, look, I really want – this book mm. if you see it anywhere could you get it for me and mail it my dad would say yes but you know i'm after this story and it's in this book have you got this and richard dorby would say i may have or when i'm next visiting this shop i'll see if i can find it they had this agreement this gentleman's agreement that they would help each other out with the stories that they were looking for and not you know as you might think might happen to today i don't know if this is this is mm. the case or not but they would there was never this sense that they were going to pinch the story you know that he would say, look, I've discovered this story, but I need a good copy of it. And Richard Dorby says, I'm going to use that. N- never saw anything like that. It was, it was very honest, very supportive. I mean, um, well, one, one of the um, kind of interesting things as you, as you speak there, and I'm going to say something now that, you know, I, I'm told there are some younger listeners of the show, um, but yes. they, they may exist. This is all happening pre, <laughs> <laughs> this is all happening pre-internet. Um, so, so, so this kind of research that's that's finding these stories, this is some proper kind of digging that's it's, going on, it's, isn't it? It's yeah, it's real detective work. Um, mm. And when we're talking like mid seventies, you know, early mid seventies, early eighties, um, and these guys are hunting down these obscure stories by really just treading treading the boards. They're going to they're going to second hand bookshops. They're, mm. they're in there for hours looking at everything. Something might look interesting. I put it out. Look at the contents, um, and then of course going to the library and seeing what other libraries have available, getting a, getting a loan of that book, and then waiting for it to come in. And some of it was just waiting. Some of them, sometimes it was. I know this book exists. I know that I need this story out of it. I'm going to just wait until someone finds it, Richard Dalby finds it, or Mike Ashley finds it, and, and then we can then we can have a swap. And, and yeah, I mean, it was it's grueling. Yeah. It's kind of lovely as well, though, isn't it, to think of those hours spent in, in bookshops, it isn't is, it? Yeah. I mean, I as a kid, I'd go to these bookshops with my dad. And yeah. I was interested for a while, but after about an hour, I was getting fidgety, <laughs> and my dad has only looked at half the shelves, and, and I'm looking around, and it's meld, musty, and, yeah, I mean, it was... But, that, but that, he, he loved it. Yeah. Well, I mean, it was clear that he did. And, and one of his uh, most significant achievements was finding those new old stories the ones yes. that no one oh, else had, had found and um the most fa- famous example i suppose is his discovery of the the, the lost mr james story the experiment yeah. so can you tell us a little bit about how that came about yeah it was uh it was a really strange coincidence um right. you, you couldn't make it up 
So uh, he used to work in the early 70s, he worked for what was the National Water Council in the UK. Yes. Um, doesn't exist anymore, but he was working as an editor and a proofreader. And he had a work colleague there, uh, name of Gordon. Mm. And, they, they, you know, they got talking and it turned out that they both were M.R. James fans. Right. But Gordon was a fan of M.R. James's work on churches and architecture. He, the, the stuff he'd written about that. Mm. He'd never read a ghost story of M.R. James. Right. So, and dad said to him, you know, dad obviously was, you know, M.R. James, his ghost stories are brilliant. And, was, and Gordon was like, oh, really? Churches. So <laughs> they kind of, you know, they started to swap their, mm. their, uh, M.R. James information and, uh, Gordon lent him a copy of a memoir of Montague Rhodes James, which was this very rare book. Mm. And so dad was flicking through it. And at the end was a list of all of his, uh, stories right. and contributions, all the things he'd written and, um, listed under the title miscellaneous was the entry for this story, which appeared in the morning post newspaper. The experiment, a ghost story. And of course, right. my dad's jaw dropped because, you know, this was like, where had this story been? It hadn't been in any of the collected words, you know, yeah. so he, um, he ordered a copy, a scan or a photocopy from the British Library and, uh, and it was legit. It was a, it was a lost of my James story. So he was putting together the manuscript for Thrill of Horror at the time yes. and decided to put it straight in, you know, no questions asked. Um, and it was, his proudest achievement as a, an anthologist. This was, this was finding a lost story from your favorite, favorite author and being able to publish it for the first time. And, and, uh, it was, it was an amazing moment for him. He was so proud. Uh, who else or what other stories do you think he was most pleased to rediscover and, and put out there for, for people? I mean, he, he was very proud of Frederick Cowles. He, when he, mm kind of got Frederick Cowles some wider exposure. He was um, he was certainly very proud of that because he thought the stories, you know, I think that he's certain people, a lot of people have said, yeah, he just rips off M.R. James, but to my mind, so what? <laughs> if you're going to rip someone off M.R. James, right? His stories are very good and they certainly give you that that sort of tingle that, that Dad was always looking for. Um, and as a result of that, he had ended up having this 18-year correspondence with uh, Frederick Cowles' wife, Doris, who... Uh, I've read the letters. She was just lovely. Um, but also Eleanor Scott. He was, mm. he was proud to have gotten Eleanor Scott out there because she kind of started it all for him. And, um, the Bensons, the other Bensons, the, the, the yes. RH, the AC Benson, who he always thought were being overshadowed by EF Benson. Yes. He was proud to get their stories, uh, a wider exposure. So. Okay. So, um, we've said about how there was a, a, a kind of boom time. Um, for this type of collection. And that was when your father was very active. You know, the mid eighties, um, we saw an emergence of, of things like Spatterpunk, uh, more extreme graphic horror. Um, it sounds like Hugh might not have been as disapproving of, of that kind of thing as I might have imagined. Um, you know, horror wise, I don't think my dad disapproved of anything really. Mm. I can't, I don't know whether we have actually read any splatterpunk literature or fiction, but certainly when it came to movies, um, he loved modern horror movies. He yes. loved gory, gruesome, whatever. He didn't, you know, it was all, it was all to his taste. I remember when we got our first video player in the early eighties, uh, it was a boom and, and we were just, yes, I was renting every horror movie that was available. And, you know, every Saturday night was horror movie night. And, I remember the first time he put Evil Dead on. I was like, oh, I was in heaven because I'd wanted to see that movie for so long. Um, so, yeah, we went on this horror movie binge. We watched all of those terrible 80s horror movies that you look back on now. And, and some of them were good, but for the most part, mm -mm. Yeah. So, yeah, all of a sudden, we were, Dad was able to like, access all of these movies that mm -hmm. he had been wanting to see for years. That, you know, And funny story, uh, my dad... When, when the video, I don't know if you remember the video nasty outrage of the, yep. the early 80s when um, the government decided that, you know, horror movies were bad for your health and they were going to make people go mad and, and commit yeah. all kinds of awful crimes. Well, when the government announced they were going to ban this list of movies, there was this list of, you know, 40 odd movies or you know, the video nasty list, they were, mm. they were going to get banned. My dad hatched this scheme. So what he did is he got the list 
and he went round to all of the local video stores and he said to them, look, this movie is going to be confiscated. I'll buy it from you. <laughs> and so, and they were, they were like, yeah, okay, I'm going to get my movie taken away. I can sell it. So he, he went and bought all of these movies that were going to get banned. So we ended up having this collection of illicit video nasties in the house. And they were still there. They were, after he died, they were still in his cupboard, all these original VHS. Yeah, so that, that, could be quite, that, that could be quite a, um, quite a priceless collection now to some people, right? It, you know what? We researched it and it's totally not. <laughs> <laughs> the problem is, I mean, say, take, you know, zombie flesh eaters, the, mm. the, the, even back then, the version that he had on VHS was cut more than the version you can now buy. Right. Yes. With an 18 certificate. On the, 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 these are all being re- re-released now, aren't they, with extra yes, features yeah. and, and so uh, remastered. Yeah. VHS didn't really have the, the, the nostalgia that vinyl seems to have. But yeah, oh, we that's just a, didn't know. That's a shame. <laughs> so um, Gaslight Nightmares 2 then it was published in 1991, and oh. that was the last new anthology um, mm-hmm. that, that came out for a while. So wh- yeah. what, what changed? Um, I mean, I don't know for certain tastes right. change, you know, mm. the market changes. I, I can't, I can't tell you definitively why the interest in those stories dwindled. Uh, it might have just been, um, saturation that happens with most things eventually. Uh, dad would send out his manuscripts to publishers, the US, the UK, and just built up a big pile of rejection letters. I mean, I have most of them right. and he became disheartened. You know, he wanted to, he, it was his passion. He wanted to share these stories. And when he kind of got to, to thinking that no one wants to have them anymore, he kind of just thought, okay, maybe this, you know, I'm done, time's over. But, uh, but then people started to approach him. So he was approached by Ashtray Press and Dover and, 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 right. and then Harper Collins uh, more recently. And, and, and he was happy to, to do these, to, to reprint these books or, or you know, the, the, the new version of Terror by Gaslight, which didn't mm. really have much in relation to the, to the original. But, and that's pretty much how it was from that point on. Right. So he did have a list of anthologies that never got taken. And then, you know, from that point, it was just a new version of this one or a new version of this one. And so, you know, I mean, but who can say? The heyday had gone, I think, in his mind. Mm. Like, well, was it was it any consolation to know that obviously he was still very well regarded and and there was a lot of affection for those? Oh yes, he, yes. he was aware um, of that, was he? That oh, he was very aware of that. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, uh, there was a I can't remember who said it. Someone in an article called him a living national treasure, and he would quote that <laughs> the, all the time. He would say if you were arguing with him or if you he didn't like what you were saying, he would say to you, "Look, I'm a living national treasure." <laughs> that's it you have nothing to say um, argument you, argument yeah. over yeah argument over are, are you a living national treasure <laughs> no so yeah he's he he knew he knew how well regarded he was he was yeah he was a very humble man but he he you know he never really went to his head he would play it up but yeah he was, he was aware that it was a niche it was a niche and within that niche he was he had a great following but you know well, he knew he wasn't Stephen King Right. <laughs> well, um, sadly, we obviously said goodbye to Hugh in yes. 2019. And, um, but now we, we've seen the publication of And Midnight Never Come, which mm-hmm. you've effectively picked up and finished off. Uh, and I believe there's a, a, another anthology due to come out. There is indeed. Yeah. So, so what um, prompted you to pick up where your father left off? Well, um, when he died, um, obviously, you know, it's, it's a very emotional time. And I was quite taken with the, the, re- the response to his death. There was a lot of, uh, I got a lot of messages through the website or, or personally from people who, you know, regarded his work. And um, it was clear to me that there was still a, an interest in his, his work and he, he still had a following. And I wanted to find a way to memorialize him. So it seemed to me the obvious thing to do would be to republish an earlier anthology that was very well known, but was now out of print. Right. You know, it's only available as a second-hand copy if you're lucky enough to find one. So um, Victorian Tales of Terror was the obvious choice. And then when I was going through the, the his original story list, I noticed there was a story missing 
that he had in his original list that wasn't in the finished book called The Werewolf. So I thought, well, why not include that in the new book because it gives it some novelty value. Um, and, and that's what I did. And then Terror by Gaslight, I decided to do next because it was effectively the sequel to Victorian Tales of Terror. Yes. And I kind of I took it a step further. I thought, well, I've got all these stories he left behind. There was a, a, a big box of photocopied stories that he never used, mm. which I had to digi- digitize all of them because my dad was not a digital person at right. all. So um, I thought, well, why not take you know a few stories, three stories that he never used and put them in the new edition and call it the memorial edition, which is what I did. And that's what gave me a taste for it. Doing mm. that, finding these stories, deciding which ones I was going to include, you know, reading through them, editing the, the, the manuscript, writing the introduction, all of it. I loved, I found I loved doing it. So um, once that was out, and I, I, I did the covers for both of them as well. Once that was done, I thought the next stop has got to be a brand new one. It's got, I've got all these stories and I yeah. did my own research and I found some stories as well. So why not do a brand new Hugh Lamb anthology? There hadn't been one since 91, as, as we discussed. So it seemed to make, it made sense to me. And the title, he had an anthology that he had lit, a story list for and Midnight Never Come, which struck me as a very poetic title. His titles were never that. They were, they were quite, you know, mm. simple, um, effective, but that one really stood out to me. It's from a Faust poem. So I thought, okay, that's my title. I can't use most of the stories, the stories that he had in the original list. He had either um, used in subsequent anthologies right. or he had, you know, given to other people to use in theirs. Right. So uh, there was only two stories in the original um, list that made it into the new volume. And the rest were either stories that he had left behind or stories that I found. Um, and that's why I kind of put my, my name on the cover for the first time. It was a joint thing because, yeah. you know, um, and, and it's been really very well received, which I've been nervous about. I, I confess I had uh, imposter syndrome when I was doing right. it, and I thought, you know, people are going to think you're kind of trying to ride on your dad's coattails. But really, I was trying to, I was trying to honour him, and I found I was also inherited his love for doing this. So I wanted to just do it. Yeah. What is it that you loved about it, and 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 has it given you any insights? I mean, is it harder work than you thought it, it might be? It's it's harder work than I thought it would might be, but I know that it's not as hard as it was in the 70s. Yes. So, yeah, I mean, I don't complain about the, you know, it, it's it's a lot of it's, it's a lot of what you could call donkey work. It's, it's um, you know, a lot of scanning, pasting, editing, proofreading. Yeah, fine. I mean, it's, it's, that comes with the territory, and it's kind of relaxing. Um, but what I really love is the scouring and, you know, you, you yeah. will, um, a lot of the stories now, they're available online, they're available in Project uh, Gutenberg or <laughs> there's, um, there's copies of the Strand magazine which are available yes. or, or all the year round. Um, uh, you know, so you just, I found it very interesting to just go and look at these and go through them and, and, and you know, that's where I found a story from, um, for, um, I think it was Terror by Gaslight, which I found in all the year round, all year round, and it had no name attributed to it. Right. So I was digging around trying to find who actually wrote the story, and I got involved with the Dickens Society and, and a guy who was compiling a list of authors for all year round. He finally told me who it was, but um, it's very gratifying. It's like it is like detective work, and when you find yeah. something and you get a result, it's uh, it's immensely gratifying. And, and there's yeah, a real hun- and there's a real hunger for this now, isn't there? So you've obviously found that there's interest in. in, in... There certainly seems to be, yes. And, yes. and I, I'm, I'm glad to hear it. Um, yeah, there does seem to be a renewed interest. Um, and I don't know, you know, I don't know why that is. I don't know if it's part of this. There seems to be a renewed interest in the the Victorian age or Edwardian ages in them on in and of themselves. You know. Yes. Downton Abbey and, and all these shows now about that that era, that, that golden age. So I don't know if it's part of that. Uh, who, you know, who knows? It's great. But it sounds like you've got uh, enough stories for another collection because there's a another one in the works. There is. Can you tell us anything about that? Is it a particular theme or? Um, it's not a particular theme. I mean, I, I obviously, it, it's again, it's a mix of stories from my dad's collection. But this time around, there's more stories that I've kind of picked. And 
the ones that I'm going for, they're either stories that weren't ever republished from their original publications in the right. you know the thirties, the thirties going back, or there's some stories that were just put into single author collections and they were only available you know fifteen twenty years ago in a small yeah. press output, right. which is not going to be available now. So it really is following Dad's idea of making these things more accessible. And that's why I decided to publish my books on, you know, Amazon and Kindle because I wanted them to be mm. more accessible, more affordable. Uh, it mattered to me because that was what my dad mm. cared about. Um, so yeah, but, but yeah, there's a new one coming. The funny thing is I hadn't intended to do another one, at least not for a while. When, when I finished the midnight never come, I, uh, I said, right, okay, time for a break. I've got to, you know, yeah. Concentrate on a few other things, but uh, a few months ago, I had a dream that I had showed at midnight never to come to my dad. I, he, he was here, um, and I he was actually here, and I showed it to him, and he was flipping through it, and he was really thrilled with it, really encouraging, and, and you know, this is great, you, you know, keep going. And um, I woke up the next day. I woke up, and that day I started working on the next one because it right. felt. I know it might sound a bit superstitious but it really did feel like you know some sort of visitation that he had you'd, you'd kind of had blessing. you'd had you'd had a blessing yes i had a blessing yeah i might be deluded and deranged but <laughs> it's the closest I, I, i've come to seeing dad as a ghost put it that way <laughs> <laughs> it's quite it's quite appropriate um yes. that the, the these anthologies are now being kind of supernaturally guided it's a selling point isn't it maybe i should it put is. it on the blur it is um and uh so uh, one of the things, obviously, that, that you've picked up um, is that you now write the uh, praises to these stories, yes. right? So, so yeah. um, and in a, in a kind of tone of voice quite similar to your father's. Probably, probably, um, sim- by, you know, naturally. Um, mm. I, I try and imitate, but I think for the most part, I don't really have to try. Yes, uh, I think we we uh, we write very similarly anyway. We have the same sense of humour and the same use of language. He he was better at it than I am, but I, I you know I learned enough. As my other half is always telling me, we all we all become more like our fathers every day, don't we? So very true. Yes, it's very true. <laughs> I get it too. In all in all in all sorts of ways. Um, yes. So we've we've talked a lot about um, Hugh, but I understand that, and you mentioned it earlier. I think um, your own writing. Can we yeah. know a little bit about your work, maybe? Sure. So I, I always enjoyed writing. Um, mm. I've always had, I think, a natural talent for it. Um, English was about the only subject, apart from art, at school that I actually did any good in. Yeah. Um, but I did choose art and design as a career path, and I went to. Um, art college and you know but uh, around 2008 I decided to start writing a screenplay um, I, I had a friend who was a retired cameraman um, and he worked in Hollywood for years um, and he had some contacts in the movie business and he was being sent scripts you know people would send him screenplays to see what he thought you know see if he could get any of them made and he would hand them to me and say what do you think of this <laughs> so I would take these things home and I'd read them and they were awful Almost all of them were just so bad. And so I would hand it back and say, yeah, no, it's, it's the dialogue's terrible. No one speaks like this. It, yeah. It's, it's really bad. So eventually I thought, you know, if you know so much, why don't you do one? Right. If you're such an expert. So, um, I did. I sat down and I wrote my first screenplay, which was, of course, a ghost story. And, um, I gave it to him. Then the next day he, he, he contacted me and he said, we have got to get this made. It's so good, which I was surprised because he doesn't really, he didn't really like horror movies, but right. he really liked it. So he started sending it around. It got picked up and optioned by a production company in London um, who really did intend to make it. I mean, I had meetings with them. Um, I went to a fundraising party, and uh, which was a weird experience. Um, but eventually it just fell through. They couldn't raise the money, so it never got made. Mm. I wrote another one, um, also a ghost story. <laughs> Can you see a pattern here? And um, same thing happened. It got optioned, financing never came around, so it got dropped. And, I, you know, obviously this is the business. It happens to yes. 90% of the movies that get optioned. So I was a little disheartened, but I carried on. Um, but the highlight came when I, um, I won a BAFTA 
new screenwriters contest for um, right. a screenplay I'd written called Debunking Dad. And right. it was it's a fa- it was a father and son road movie with a supernatural theme to it, very much based on my relationship with my dad, right. um, very much based on, you know, what it, or growing up with someone who is obsessed with ghosts and the supernatural and being a child around that. And so, you know, it, it's about this father and son. Um, the father is a supernatural um, enthusiast and, and, and you know, uh, does talks around the country. And his son is a skeptic and a debunker and writes for debunking magazines. Right. And, you know, they, there are odds. But um, the father finds out that, you know, he's, uh, he's dying. And so they end up going on this road trip together, you know, bickering and bonding and, and, uh, and it won this contest, and, and my wife loves it. My wife thinks it's the best thing I ever wrote. My dad adored it because he read it and thought, "That's me." He would say, "That's me." I say that. That's me. And he loved it. And uh, yeah, I won the contest, and I went to the BAFTA um, headquarters. I had a Q and A Q&A on stage, um, right. and they performed ten minutes from the script. And I had agents coming up to me and all send me what you've got, which I did. And nothing ever happened, and, and I kind of gave up. I kind of thought, right, this is, this is ridiculous. I'm busting my ass writing these things. Nothing's happening. I got kind of petulant about it. But, um, the recent years, my wife's been, you know, badgering me. You've got to get that out right. there. You've got to get it made. So I kind of dusted it off, um, last year and started polishing up a bit. And oh, this is great. And yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to get it out there. I'm going to try and get it made because it deserves to be. And I would like to do it really now just for my dad's sake as well, because it is, it's so much about him. Absolutely. And it sounds um, it sounds terrific and really interesting um, it's, and funny. I'm proud of it. It's yeah. funny. It's funny. Yeah, it's funny. Mm. It's funny. It's funny for anyone who's ever had a dad. <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, yeah. it's a broad market. Absolutely. Uh, so, um, do you see yourself continuing uh, the family business long term? I mean, we've said there's another collection. You know, could we see Richard Lamb anthologies yeah. for the next decade? The decade. I won't, after? I won't rule it out. You know, I right. won't rule it out. I enjoy doing it. And if there's a market for it, if there's an appetite for it, then sure. Obviously, you know, I, I don't pretend to be anywhere near as accomplished as Mike Ashley or my father, you know, any of these, these old school anthologists. I'm, I am not there. I'm an enthusiast at best, but if people want to want more of these stories, if people would, you know, are interested in the books, then absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Good. Well, that's good to know. And uh, if you ever want to do a, a, an anthology of modern authors, uh, can I just uh, ask you to remember your host uh, ah, here today? Okay. Uh, I, will, you know, I will bear I, that I, in mind. I will gladly uh, give you one of my original stories. Uh, it would be an honour right. to be in a lamb anthology. <laughs> um, but uh, right now, it's been lovely to talk to you. And um, yes, likewise. Uh, if. Uh, if the listeners, um, who've no doubt been enthralled by this, uh, if they want to find out more about you and your father's work, where should they look? Uh, they should look at hulam.com. Okay. It's uh, kept it simple. This is the website that I, I built for Dad um, a few years ago. And I kept saying to him, you need a website. You know, you've got to have a website. Every author has a website now. Every and, and he didn't have a computer or anything. He was, like, oblivious. So I built the site, yes. and then I had to print every page on paper and mail it to him from the US so he could see the website because he didn't have a computer or a phone or anything. And um, he, he liked it. He said, he said, this is really good. I like it. We checked over the information. Then he said to me, will I be getting lots of emails now? <laughs> so uh, I had to explain to him that without an email address, that was h- hardly likely. <laughs> um, I'll be getting them, if anything. So, yeah. But it's, you know, I, I, I maintain it. Uh, it's got a bibliography. It's got a gallery. You can sign up for updates when they come. So yeah, if you need any information about QLAM, QLAM.com is a contact form. If you want to ask a question, I'm. Um, and I think most importantly, uh, is that the most recent editions, um, of the anthologies are all linked to, aren't they? So people can see. They're all right there. Yeah. The reissues. QLAM books that you can buy, um, mm. um, you know, on Amazon or whatever, they're available as the direct links. Um, in, in their handsome new editions as well, aren't they? In their handsome new editions, yes. <laughs> Very much so. Beautifully handcrafted. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Richard. That's been uh, a delight all, and uh, fascinating, pleasure. obviously, to hear. Um, I about certainly hope so. I, I, yeah, I, I hope so. Um, it's been fun.
Thank you very much. If you enjoy the show and would like to support me, there are several ways you can do so. You can make a one-off donation through Ko-fi. You can join as a YouTube channel member or become a patron on Patreon and make a monthly contribution, gaining access to exclusive content. Liking, commenting, sharing and subscribing all help the channel grow. Thank you for listening and until next time, sweet dreams. <laughs>